Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for sorting out the risks and benefits of medications for dementia and mild cognitive impairment. My name is Ashley Haas, and I'm the Director of Consumer Information here at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. This session today is being offered as part of the Administration for Community Living, Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiative Project, Expansion of Dementia-Capable Communities Within Urban and Rural Settings in Ohio, Using Evidence-Based and Informed Programming. Today's webinar will be recording during the recorded. During the webinar, you may submit a question at any time using the chat feature or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We do have staff monitoring the Q&A and chat to convey any questions you may have to our presenter during the Q&A portion of the webinar and to answer any technical questions that you may have. You can turn on captions by selecting live transcript, which is the button with two C's at the bottom of your screen. We are conducting an evaluation of our dementia education sessions as part of this project. You should have received an email with a link to the pre-session evaluation questionnaire, which also contains further information about the evaluation. If you did not have a chance to complete the pre-session questionnaire, we ask that you please complete this now using the link provided in the chat. By doing so, you are helping others in your community. Your responses and feedback will be used to show the impact of programs like these and to improve the tools and resources provided to individuals living with dementia and the people who support them. I now have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this afternoon's presentation, Ms. Sue Fosnight. Ms. Fosnight is a clinical lead pharmacist in geriatrics at Summa Health in Akron, Ohio, with a joint appointment as a professor in the Department of Pharm Pharmacy Practice at Northeast Ohio Medical University, Neomed. She trained at Ohio State University and is a certified as a uh, pharmacother pharmacotherapy specialist and geriatric pharmacist specialist. Ms. Fosnight is a member of interprofessional teams that provide care to geriatric patients both in and out of the hospital. She has been awarded the National Excellence in Geriatric Pharmacy Practice Award by the Commission for Certification in Geriatric Pharmacy. She has also been a finalist in the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacist Safety Award for the project Prevent and Delirium and has been awarded the Ohio Society of Health Systems Pharmacist Pharmacist of the Year Award. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Fosnight. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am going to be talking about medications that we use to treat both dementia and mild cognitive impairment. So I'm happy you can all be here with me. Uh, what we're going to talk today about, I, what I hope you'll know by the end of this presentation, is to be able to identify medications used to treat dementia and mild cognitive impairment. You should be able to describe the stage and type of dementia where each medication is used summarize the benefits and risks of each medication, explain tips to optimize medications, and finally, we're going to discuss new medications that are close to being marketed for dementia and mild cognitive impairment, and I'll tell you how I chose those medications. All right, to get started with, I wanted to start talking a, a bit about the fact um, that we have some new names for both mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And I have new in quotation marks because they're not that new. They've been out for um, several years, I think more than several years actually. So um, we use, we, what we talk to, about as mild cognitive impairment, the official name for it is now, is mild neurocognitive disorder. Dementia is um, now called major neurocognitive disorder. And as I said, not many people use those official names. So I chose to go with mild cognitive impairment and dementia as I'm talking uh, today. But in case you are reading um, information and see it referred to as something else, you'll know that it is the same thing. All right, let's see. There we go. My next slide didn't want to come on. All right, so talking a little bit about the symptoms of dementia. Um, so memory loss and mild cognitive impairment as well. So memory loss is certainly something uh, that is probably one of the first things that people start to notice. Uh, we can see impaired judgment, planning, and organ 
in organizing. So might appear as people having trouble with keeping up with their finances, uh, impaired le learning. And all of those are, are fairly common things that we see with either mild cognitive impairment or mild um, dementia as symptoms. Now, as dementia progresses, we may see more severe symptoms or more serious symptoms, such as loss of language, loss of the ability to identify objects, impaired ability to carry out motor activities despite still having good motor function, um, trouble with swallowing, um, bowel and bladder incontinence, and inability to care for um, themselves. We also can see uh, some personality changing changes, some anxiety, depression, disorientation, confusion, hallucinations, wandering, and disruptive behavior. So you can see um, in the full course of dementia, there are many, many symptoms that are possible that ha can happen. Certainly all of these don't happen to everybody. And then another consideration is that there are other disease states that can also have these types of symptoms as well. So having these symptoms don't necessarily mean there is a dementia diagnosis. Uh, some of the most common ones are uh, depression and delirium or other things that happen that have similar disease needs. Now, I wanted to just let you know a little bit of the difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So for mild cognitive impairment, we don't really have any uh, effect on independence when, um, so these patients may have some of those early symptoms, but they're still able to do what we call the instrumental activities of daily living. Uh, those instrumental activities of daily living are a little bit um, different than what I know some of you probably know that there are activities of daily living as well. Those are things uh, like bathing, dressing, walking, uh, toileting, and eating. These instrumental activities of daily living are what we're really looking for uh, with dementia. And those would be uh, managing finances, shopping, cooking, managing medications, doing housework, driving, using the phone. So if we see impairment in those type of things, uh, then this would be a dementia rather than a mild cognitive impairment. So the testing for the mild cognitive impairment and dementia may end up being the same score, but we would end up looking also at these activities to decide if it has moved on to dementia or if it's mild cognitive impairment. And dementia is really an umbrella term, which just means that dementia uh, is a term that covers a lot of different types of dementia. I have the most common types, but this is not all inclusive. Uh, certainly Alzheimer's disease is our most common type of dementia. And likely because of that, that's where most of the research is really focused on Alzheimer's dementia. Vascular dementia often occurs um, after a stroke occurs or a patient with um, cerebrovascular disease. Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia, there are a lot of people that feel that those two dementias are the same thing. Uh, Lewy body dementia is uh, what we call it when the dementia symptoms occur before the Parkinson's disease symptoms. And Parkinson's disease dementia is if the Parkinson's disease is in a place for about a year before the dementia symptoms. Frontotemporal dementia is another type of dementia. It's one that's particularly hard to treat. Our traditional uh, medications don't work very well for it. And then we also have what we call reversible dementia. And reversible dementia is usually caused by B12 deficiency. It might be caused by a thyroid deficiency and sometimes medications. And we'll talk about that in a minute, a little bit more can also cause us that reversible dementia. And I did want to stress that oftentimes we see more than one type of dementia present. Next, as we start to delve, before we delve into the medications, I wanna talk a little bit about the different stages of dementia. And this is important as we talk about the medications because uh, not all the medications work for all the different stages of dementia. So we do have mild, moderate, and severe. Um, and we can determine that by, by doing oh. testing that will show us exactly. And um, these are generally oral tests that are done that show us what stage the patient is in. 
All right, now uh, this slide is a little bit more complicated, so I don't know how many of you are interested in um, actually the mechanisms of the medication, but I thought I would put this a little bit of this in. So I want to start out with Alzheimer's dementia. And as I said, that Alzheimer's dementia is the one that has been the most studied. And what we know about that is that in Alzheimer's dementia, there is an alteration in the elimination of a protein in the brain. It's called the amyloid precursor protein. And that basically causes these protein fragments that then form these amyloid plaques. Um, that in the amyloid accumulation causes some inflammation, which uh, contributes to cell death. And then many feel like this amyloid um, plaques really can cause some of the other things that I have on here um, as well. So for instance, uh, we know that it causes the inflammation. Um, it may be related to the fact that these tau proteins, which we also have in our brain, uh, will tend to combine with phosphate. And once they combine with phosphate, then they no longer can support these microtubules that are basically uh, support the structure of the cell. And then this causes the cell to co collapse and we end up with these um, neurofibrillary tangles or often called the tau tangles. Um, we also know that we see losses of neurons and rece receptors in the brain, especially those in the cholinergic sy system. We can see dysregulation of another system that helps with memory and learning called the glutamate system. Uh, we know that there could be a hereditary uh, component. So the API E4, and it's actually API Happy E epsilon four allele is actually what it is. And that just means it's a place on the chromosome that tends to control or, or have some effect on the clearance and deposition of amyloid. So we'll talk more about that, how um, that's important, especially with some of the side effects of the medications. And we do know that vascular disease can make Alzheimer's disease worse. Having a little bit of delay in, in my slides advancing for some reason. All right, that seems to work. All right, so uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of diagrams. I don't know if, it, you know, I know I'm more of a somebody that learns better with pictures, so I'm sure there are some on here. Uh, and this is just a, um, depiction of what's going on with the healthy neuron versus the diseased neuron. And I, I would say there's the tau proteins and the microtubules are, are intracellular, while um, these amyloid plaques are outside the cell. But I think it's a fair representation of what's going on. And you can see with our healthy neuron, and we, um, we have the cell here, and with the neuron, you can see the microtubular dissociation. So it's just starting to unravel. And as I said, that this occurs when the uh, tau proteins take on, um, bind with phosphate. And as this unravels, the pieces of tau start to form into these little tangles. Um, and then we also see over here, the amyloid plaque that can occur as well. So those all are things that we are concerned with that uh, we don't know for sure, but we feel that they may be part of what is causing the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. All right, for the cholinergic system, as I said, there are different systems where we, where we do um, lose receptors and also neurotransmitters. The cholinergic system is one that we have targeted with medications, so I'm presenting that. Um, so the neuron basically re re uh, leases an, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, and then that binds to the cholinergic receptor and that helps to provide brain function. Oops. And we'll talk about where the drug um, is with that, where the drug interferes with that in a few minutes. And then we also have the glutamate uh, system. And as I said, that helps with learning and memory. And just very simply, the glutamate is, again, uh, 
chemical or neurotransmitter that basically binds to the N-methyl D aspartate receptor, or we call it an NMDA receptor, and that facilitates learning and memory. All right, so that kind of surrounded all the different um, possibilities of what's going on with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, for vascular dementia, we do know there is dysregulation of the amyloid in uh, vascular dementia as well. We do know that strokes can definitely um, cause or contribute to vascular dementia. For Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia, both of these, and we, again, we think they are the same thing, um, is really caused by protein as well. It's a misfolded protein. It's called alpha-synuclein. Uh, and then these alpha, these proteins form what we call Lewy bodies. And these are found throughout the brain, but when they get into the cortex of the brain where we have the higher brain function, uh, then they can definitely cause uh, the dementia as well. Or, and then the frontotemporal dementia, we see this as a special type of dementia that affects both the frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, we do think that this is more related to the tau protein. There's also the tar DNA binding protein that has just recently been discovered that probably plays a role in this as well. All right, so you can see that there's lots of different um, mechanisms of, in lots of different places where drugs may be able to be used to help uh, prevent dementia. Uh, I wanted to just, before we talk about the drugs in particular, I wanted to give you a little bit about common medications that might uh, cause or contribute to mild cognitive impairment or dementia. So to start out with is benzodiazepines. Those are drugs like the most common examples that I have up here are the alprazolam or Xanax, the razepam or Ativan, clonazepam or clonopin. So these are medications that are used for anxiety. Um, if the dose is too high for a patient, certainly they can contribute to dementia symptoms. And then also, if we take these medications away too quickly, so if they are taken, a patient is taken off of them, um, patients withdrawal, and that can cause symptoms that are very similar to dementia as well. Non-benzodiazepine receptor agonists are um, another group of drugs that can be related to dementia um, as well. Again, for the same reasons, if the drug dose is not right for that particular patient, or if we wean these off too quickly, then again, those can cause dementia symptoms. Anticholinergic medications is a big group of medications. Uh, most of these are older medications. There are a lot of medications that do hit the cholinergic receptor. Um, and as that is the receptor that uses acetylcholine. Uh, so it is a receptor that has been looked at as possibly being associated with dementia. So we certainly want to stay away from these products in our patients that are have either MCI or dementia. Um, and in most older patients, we'd like to stay away from this group of drugs. The most common ones that I still see used are hydroxazine or Vistaril, diphenhydramine or Benadryl, cyclobenzaprine, which is Flexeril, methocarbamol, which is Robaxin, oxybutynin is Ditropin, and amitriptyline is Elevil. And all of these where I gave you the actual, both the generic name and the brand name, they have multiple brand names, but I listed the one that's most common. And then lastly, pain medications when the dose is too high. So certainly we want to keep our patients all out of pain, but we have to be careful with the pain medication dosing oftentimes can cause those dementia type symptoms if the dose is too high. Um, and Honestly, almost any medication that affects the central nervous system, so that gets into the brain, if the dose isn't right, that those medications can also cause some issues. Um, now, I do want to put this warning on that we should never stop these medications without checking with the prescriber first. Um, and many of these medications have to be slowly weaned, so we don't want to do a sudden stop. All right, before I get into the medications, uh, did anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? We did have a couple of questions that came in related to medications, Sue. Okay. Um, so there were a couple of questions about 
um, specific medications. So um, one was about melatonin. Could it increase the likelihood of dementia? And related to that, um, could gabapentin uh, cause memory problems? Okay, those are both excellent questions. And I think this is a good time to, to cover that. So melatonin, um, both melatonin and gabapentin do get into the central nervous system. So both can have that possible dementia um, if the dose is not correct. Um, melatonin in particular is something that has actually been shown to decrease dementia or actually decrease delirium. So, um, so melatonin is one that I feel is safer for our older patients with dementia rather than um, some of the other drugs that we can use for, um, for sleep. So it is one that normally in our practice we would start out with. Uh, you do have to be careful about the dose and with melatonin, it's not available um, as a prescription product. So you always have to worry about that it's coming from a reputable manufacturer. I always recommend the USP branded manufacturers. So making sure that that means that they go and submit their, um, their medication to, for review um, and basically for analysis to the FDA. So a little bit better for that. Gabapentin um, is a medication I think that as long as the dose is okay, that many patients can tolerate, but it's one of those medications. It's primarily used for pain these days. And um, just like all pain medications, we have to be careful of the dose. All right, well, thank you for those questions and I'm gonna keep going and we'll take more questions in a few minutes. Um, so I wanted to start out with which medications are approved for mild cognitive impairment and then for the different stages of dementia. So starting out with mild cognitive impairment, we only have one medication class for mild cognitive impairment at this point, and that is the anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies that contains lecambi or lecanemab, which has full FDA approval now, and then also adahelm or aducanemab, which has basically an expedited FDA approval. And we'll talk more about what the differences in those FDA approvals would really mean for patients. Um, next, we have for mild dementia. So for mild dementia, we do have those anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies. And then we also have the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And remember those acetylcholinesterase inhibitors um, are, are drugs that, those are drugs that have been out uh, probably the longest for the treatment of dementia. So those include donepezil or Aricept, rivastigmine or Exelon is the trade name. And then galantamine is really only being um, manufactured as a generic at this point. We also have um, moderate dementia. Uh, so for moderate dementia on top of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. We also have the N-methyl-D aspartate or NMDA receptor antagonist. And it really is a partial antagonist and that medication is called memantine or namenda. And then finally for severe dementia, we it's the same as for moderate dementia. We have the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and the NMDA receptor antagonist memantine. So one of the things that you may be thinking is why don't we use these drugs and um, why are they just focused on these different stages? I will say that the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors have been uh, tested for um, mild cognitive impairment and they have shown that they do not have an effect. Memantine has been tested for mild dementia and has been shown to not have an effect for that. So uh, these drugs that are used at these different stages is really based on the literature evidence. And I wanted to include a slide. This doesn't have too much to do with medications, but we should always think about treatments for mild cognitive impairment and prevention of dementia are really just a healthy lifestyle. So making sure low fat and low cholesterol diet, high in vegetables and fruit, uh, exercise, physical, mental, and social activity, blood pressure control, glucose control, weight control, um, cholesterol control, avoid tobacco use, head injuries have been associated with dementia. So wearing helmets, um, vaccinations also um, are have 
been shown to actually prevent other diseases that could possibly uh, aggravate dementia. So keeping your vaccinations up to date as well. And I do want to point out there's, that there's a lot of evidence for this, and I have listed all the different um, articles that this really came from. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about each individual drug class, and we're going to start out with our newest group of medications, and I would say maybe our most controversial group. Uh, this medication is, these medications are the anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies, and remember that we have the problems that our diseased neuron has that accumulation of tall tangles and amyloid plaque. And this drug really does ta uh, tackle that amyloid plaque and um, has been shown to reduce the amyloid plaque. We have two drugs in this class, the aducanumab or adohelm and lecanumab or lecembi. Um, aducanumab originally was approved for Alzheimer's dementia without really saying um, what particular type of Alzheimer's dementia. It did come through that accelerated approval. Um, and that was because there really aren't great drugs out for dementia. Um, the package insert was updated to state that it should be used for mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. Um, now, continued approval for this indication uh, really might be contingent upon verification of the clinical benefit. Uh, so, what we have with the aducanumab is we have one trial that showed that it did have some effect and one trial that showed that it did not have some effect. So right now, uh, this medication has not really been approved um, by the FDA in the traditional process. And what that means for patients is that it is not covered by insurance, not covered by Medicare. So with a price tag that is, um, the last I checked, it was about $25,000 to $26,000 per year. That's uh, a lot to be paid for without it being supplemented by insurance. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that because until it gets the full FDA approval, I don't think, um, I'm not seeing that drug being used. The next medication is lecanemab or lecembi. It's approved for Alzheimer's disease, mild dementia, or mild cognitive impairment only. Um, it did get that accelerated approval process in January of 2023, but then it got approval via the traditional process in July 2023, which means that this medication now is um, covered in part by Medicare, and then other insurances are starting to cover it as well. It is our only medication with full FDA approval for mild neurocognitive impairment. We've talked about that already. And what it really does is it reduces the rate of decline of Alzheimer's dementia uh, with both the mild neurocognitive impairment uh, form of Alzheimer's dementia and then also the um, mild dementia. So it has not really been tested in moderate or severe dementia. So talking about what, what is the study that led to this approval, I thought this would be good for you to be uh, familiar with some of the good parts of the study and the ones that are not so good. So this was an 18-month randomized placebo-controlled trial. So that is a very um, good design. So does provide us with information that we can trust when we have a randomized placebo-controlled trial. Um, I thought it was also nice that they analyzed for the subgroups as well. Uh, so they looked at mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease, the presence or absence of other approved treatments for Alzheimer's disease. They looked at that apolipoprotein E, whether patients were carriers of that particular um, for, uh, they were carriers of the apolipoprotein E, or they were not carriers of that. And then they also looked at geographic region, which they really didn't find any difference, and I'm not going to cover that part of it. For inclusion criteria, mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease, the patients were 50 to 90 years old, so we would think about whether we should be using this in patients that were under 50 or over 90. Um, the, they did show amyloid positive. So in order to be part of the study, you did have to have a PET scan, 
or a lumbar puncture and show that, yes, you do have amyloid uh, because it targets amyloid and that would make sense. Um, and then they did use the Wechsler memory scale to actually show impairment in memory. Uh, the intervention was either the lecanemab infusion every two weeks or placebo. And they did look at the difference between the placebo group and the patients that got the lecanemab infusion and found them to be very similar. Something I wanted to point out is there were a lot of exclusion criteria uh, in this study. So the fact that there are so many exclusion criteria, if someone would fall into one of these categories, then, um, then I would feel like this hasn't really been studied in that particular uh, group of people. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of these, that any neurological condition that may be contributing to cognitive impairment um, besides Alzheimer's disease was an exclusion criteria. The patient had a history of a transient ischemic attack. Uh, for those of you not with a medical background, you might know that as a mini stroke or a stroke or seizures in the last 12 months, those patients were excluded. Any psych diagnosis or symptoms that they felt would interfere with the patient being able to actually um, answer the questions that were a part of this study. Um, if they were positive for the geriatric depression score, and that would be um, equal to eight at screening, it's a little bit higher than what is always considered, what is some consider to be positive. Um, contraindications to MRI scanning, that would make sense because you have to have MRIs throughout this um, when you're taking these, this medication. So evidence on the MRI of other um, clinically significant lesions. And when we go, let's see, doesn't wanna go to the next slide again. Okay, here we go. And then other significant pathological findings on the brain um, with MRIs at screening. Uh, then, and I'm gonna skip through a couple of these because I don't think they're as applicable or they're just kind of, we do know that you wouldn't take it at that time. Um, so subjects with a bleeding disorder that is not under adequate control, including a low platelet count. So uh, they excluded those because one of the study of the adverse effects can be some what they call micro hemorrhages that can occur in the brain. So if they have a low thyroid stimulating hormone that needed to be corrected before starting the drug, and then abnormally low serum vitamin B12 levels. And as we talked about before, these are what's considered to be part of um, the reversible um, dementia. So we want to get those done, um, taken care of as well. All right. Also, if um, the patient did answer, if score positive for the, they use the particular kind of suicide severity, um, suicide screen called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. If they were known or suspected to have a history of drug or alcohol abuse or dependence within two years, um, and there were some qualifications in there, and any other medical conditions. And they gave examples of cardiac, respiratory, gastrointestinal, or renal disease, which are not stable or adequately controlled. That would also be an exclusion. So we ended up with a total of 26 exclusions. Uh, so this did exclude quite a few patients. And that's something to keep in mind when thinking about whether this would be appropriate for a particular person. Um, primary measurement was the change from baseline at month 18 of clinical dementia rating score sum of boxes. So this is a fancy way to say that this is basically a test to just help to decide what the severity of dementia is. Um, and we had lots of secondary endpoints, including the amyloid burden, um, and then a lot of other um, cognition screens, and some of the cognition screens also uh, included things that affected function as well. They didn't do all these screens on everybody, and that was one of my questions, is I didn't get a clear um, feel for when these would be done, which group of patients these were done on and why. All right, so showing you the difference in this, this primary um, outcome measure, which was the clinical dementia rating scale or CDR as we call it, the sum of boxes just means that uh, they added up the scores in the different categories. 
And what they really showed was that there was a 0.45 difference. Uh, and that 0.45 difference would be favoring lecanemab uh, over placebo. I like to put on there, if I have it, how many points are in the scale, and it was an 18-point scale. So yes, this is a significant difference. Uh, one of the things that we worry about is that 0.45 whether that is really a clinical significance. Uh, previously, they had established that a clinical significance would be a change by 0.5. So that 0.45 doesn't quite meet that. It's close, but doesn't meet that. So that would be one of the concerns. And like I said, yes, this is a significant difference. We can also see the ADAS cog that's on the second line. That, that is, um, I'm gonna point that one out because that is also one that has been used in other studies. We saw a difference of 1.44 points out of a 70 point scale. So again, significant difference, not sure if it would really be a clinical difference. The ad comes is similar with a 0 0.05 out of a 1.97 scale. One thing that we definitely saw some difference in, a big difference in, is basically the ability to decrease the amyloid burden. This drug worked very well to decrease the amyloid burden. Other things I wanted to mention uh, with this lecanemab um, is that they did, as I mentioned before, have those subgroups. Um, so the subgroups is information that is helpful to basically stimulate, stimulate other studies. But some of the things that we can see from this subgroup is that basically those patients that were taking symptomatic Alzheimer's disease at baseline had a bet, had more <clears throat> of a difference in that primary, um, the CDR SB was the primary outcome than those patients that did not. Um, so that was a difference between 0.48 to 0.39. Also, the patients that had mild cognitive impairment had less of a difference um, in, this, in this scale than the um, patients with mild Alzheimer's disease. And we can see in mild Alzheimer's disease, it actually passed that 0.5 threshold while it did not with MCI. And then an important part of this also is remember that we do have a hereditary portion of Alzheimer's disease. And they found that those patients that <clears throat> were non-carriers of the gene, um, the ApoE4 gene, actually um, did show more of a difference than those that actually were carriers. So we would hope that the patients with carriers, so those are patients that um, would definitely would hope we can find a drug that would work for them. Uh, but in this, it, we really showed that that didn't work as well in the patients that were carriers. All right, another part of the issue with these medications um, is I wanna talk about the amyloid related imaging abnormalities. So we have, and this is uh, basically um, something that is really unique to this class of medication. So as this is getting rid of the amyloid, it seems to be causing these um, amyloid-relating imaging abnormalities. And this is something that you would see on an MRI. Um, <clears throat> they have for lecanemab, they called it area hemosiderin, which are basically referring to these little microbleeds that can occur in the brain. And then they also have area E, which is area edema, which refers to swelling that occur in the brain. So the symptoms of the area are headache, confusion, visual changes, dizziness, nausea, and gait dif difficulty. Um, and then they say that you can also get seizures, stroke symptoms may also occur. So these are uh, very concerning, these amyloid-relating imaging abnormalities. We also can see infusion-related reactions. These mostly are not reasons that, um, that you would not be able to take the drug, but some type of an infusion-related reaction can occur in about one out of five patients. We can see headache, cough, and diarrhea. So I want to spend a little bit of time about this area E's, area E's because I think both the area E and area H are um, issues that are important to be aware of. So this area E is edema, 
And it does also have some effect with the patients that are non-carriers, we can see that it's a much lower incidence than those that have one of the ApoE4 alleles on their gene. Um, and then patients with two ApoE4 alleles on, on two different genes, um, you, get, you see that it's even higher. Um, for placebo, we do see that we see some issues and that are higher also when we have those two genes that have the ApoE4 allele, um, but nowhere near as high as what we would see when lacanabab is given as well. And then for REAH, we can see also a similar situation where uh, the non-carriers have less incidence than the patients that actually have that ApoE4 allele on their genes. Mortality was lower with lecanemab. Infusion-related reactions we already talked about. Headache uh, occurred slightly more than placebo. Dizziness occurred uh, just very slightly more than placebo. So other than the area, um, I would say the side effects of lecanemab are fairly manageable, but area is a big issue. Um, other considerations with lecanemab is it's one-hour infusion every two weeks. It has to happen at an infusion center. Uh, prior to treatment, the manufacturer states you should screen for the ApoE4 status. Um, so this would basically be a genetic test that would be done, um, confirm the presence of amyloid beta pathology, so PET scan or lumbar puncture, and have a prior to treatment MRI. During therapy, the uh, MRI um, has to occur before the fifth, seventh, and 14th infusion. And this is really to monitor for area. And if there's symptoms of area, then the um, more MRIs would be done. So we would just want to make sure that we weren't having any problem. Cost of LACMB is $26,500 per year. 80% of that is covered by Medicare. I'm not sure if all the testing will be covered or not. And I am seeing more and more insurances uh, picking this up, but not sure if all insurers will be covering this. So some tips to optimize use for LACMB would be to check ApoE4 status to help inform decision uh, prior to use. Uh, the manufacturer does recommend this, and I do think this is very important, um, especially with that subgroup data, even though we'd rather see that done as a separate study. It is a little bit concerning that with patients that are especially um, carrying alleles on both genes that, that we might end up with um, less benefit and more chance of side effects. You wanna to report to the prescriber any symptoms of air areas um, report to the prescriber if you have a new diagnosis. So remember some of those diagnoses that uh, they excluded patients. Um, and definitely if you're taking a medication to thin blood or if adjustments are needed um, when you to dose the blood thinner, that is something to make sure that your um, who is providing the lecanemab knows about as well. And then also keep on the schedule for the MRIs because I think that is the best way to protect against the area. There is definitely some um, basically procedures in place if you see those microhemorrhages, even be, if you're not symptomatic, that this medication would be held for a time to make sure that those don't progress. All right, so I spent most of our time talking about these, this drug that is the brand new drug because I get the most questions about that. Uh, but we have two more classes of drugs that are FDA approved. So right now we have three classes of drugs FDA approved for dementia. Uh, and only one class of drug that is FDA approved for mild cognitive impairment, which was the anti-amyloid um, monoclonal antibodies. So for our acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, we have three of them, donepezol, rivastigmine, and galantamine. Um, donepezol, they're all approved for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, rivastigmine is approved for mild to moderate um, Alzheimer's disease, except for the patch, it's is approved for severe. Um, and then um, we also see that many off-label uses. So I would say most of our off-label studies have really been done with donepezol, but we do have off-label studies done with rivastigmine and galantamine as well. Um, 
so Exelon or rivastigmine does have that approval for Parkinson's disease, the full FDA approval, while the other medications uh, have studies supporting its use, but not necessarily the approval. And it is only approved for mild to mar moderate uh, Parkinson's disease dementia. So how do these medications work? This should be a familiar to you. We just talked about it. So what happens is we need that acetylcholine to, get, to basically stimulate the cholinergic receptor. Uh, so we can use acetylcholine esterase. Uh, basically is a chemical that degrades acetylcholine. So um, when we use that, the acetylcholine esterase just as part of the normal way to get rid of acetylcholine. And what we have developed are these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And what they do is they block the removal of acetylcholine. So that keeps more acetylcholine available to stimulate that receptor. These drugs also decrease in progression of disease. So just like what we talked about with the anti-amyloid monoclonal and uh, in the anti-amyloid monoclonal um, antibodies is that these only decrease the progression of disease. We don't expect it to completely stop the disease and we don't expect it to reverse the disease. All And unfortunately, we do not have a medication uh, that does that. A little bit about these anticholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, I did choose to use the Cochrane Systemic Review for the basis um, for the sake of time and not look at each one in particular. Again, these have randomized controlled trials um, and this Cochrane Review does have a good process to really show us if these medications are effective. Um, and they required that the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors were at the manufacturer recommended dose at the time that this study was done or this review was done. They used the mini mental state exam, a very common um, outcome or a common test that we use to actually test if someone has a dementia. Um, and they were just looking at dementia with this, and they looked at the ADAS COG also. So they did find a significant difference in the MMSE. And as all these studies, I, you know, it's a small difference. So uh, we see a 1.37 point difference between placebo and the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and that's out of a 30 uh, point scale. It did favor the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. The ADS COG was looked at as well, and it found a 2.37 difference favoring the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And you may remember that lacanumab also used this ADS COG as one of their outcomes, and they really just found a 1.44 difference. So you really can't compare because the studies aren't exactly the same, but, um, but it is interesting that, uh, is that we did see less of a change with the uh, lacanumab. All right, so what are the risks for acetylcholinesterase inhibitors would be a slow heart rate, abnormal dreams, incontinence, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So we have much less risk with this drug class than we would with the um, with the, our previous drug class, those amyloid binders, um, those monoclonal antibodies. All right, so looking again at these drugs, what are the advantages between the classes? Not really too much. Uh, you know, as we talked about before, some of them have been more studied in different types of dementia than others. Uh, the denapazole has one daily dose and also a fast dissolving tablet for people uh, that have trouble swallowing tablets. It also just recently has a one weekly, once weekly patch, which is uh, still fairly expensive. Uh, a little bit more data on the off-label uses, as I mentioned before. Rivastigmine has that once daily patch, uh, which the once daily patch may help with decreasing the nausea that might occur and the GI effects. As a liquid formulation, uh, galantamine again has a liquid formulation and once daily if you use the XR form. All right, so optimizing use, we increase the dose very slowly for uh, for the all of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and that's basically to limit the GI effects that can occur. Um, if somebody is getting prolonged nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, certainly something to report to the prescriber, uh, switching to a transdermal product, uh, 
rivastigmine has just uh, has become a generic form transdermal product uh, within the last few years. So that might be an, an option that is still not outrageously priced. Um, if abnormal dreams occur, you can skip that evening dose and start, and start taking every morning instead. I would uh, recommend to verify that's okay with your prescriber, but that is routinely done. Um, any dizziness, fatigue, or falls should be reported to the prescriber, and we want to make sure that this is not abruptly stopped. There are occasions where we do need to stop it uh, quickly. That would be primarily in patients who are having problems with a slow heart rate. But normally, if we can, we would like to wean this. And uh, you can get some withdrawal symptoms if you don't wean. All right. And then our last of the third group of drugs, the memantine. So, um, and it looks like I'm just a little over time. So I'll go a little bit faster here. So memantine basically uh, affects memory and learning and it works well, but we, we see in Alzheimer's disease is we can see too much glutamate. And when that happens, we don't see the memory and learning. So if you use that partial antagonist memantine, it blocks partially the glutamate. And then we do see memory and learning. It is FDA approved for moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, been tested and mild and did not work. Off-label, um, it has been approved for Parkinson's disease, dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies and vascular dementia, if it's present with other dementias. So um, with Alzheimer's dementia in particular. So we do see a decrease in progression again, um, but we do not see this reversing disease this trial was a 28-month randomized placebo-controlled trial, so a good design as well. Uh, we did see patients had to have cognitive impairment uh, due to Alzheimer's disease, age over 50 years old, residing in the community. So that one test, the MMSC that measures cognition would be three to 14, and then several other, other um, memory type of test, memory and function that they needed to to achieve a certain amount on. They got memantine that was worked up to a dose of 10 milligrams twice a day or placebo. And they found baseline characteristics were about the same. And we can see a 0.3 difference out of a 21 point scale. Um, so again, not definitely significantly different, but we wonder about clinically um, different as well. The memantine, if the dose is increased too quickly, or if the patient's uh, renal function decreases, we might end up with worsening confusion with the memantine. Um, so optimizing use would be to contact the prescriber if worsening confusion occurs soon after starting it. The dose should be weaned up, uh, increasing the dose each week to minimize side effects, and you should not abruptly stop this at, at, at all possible as well. All right, so briefly talking about those closest to marketing, donanumab. Donanumab is another anti-amyloid monoclonal antibody, uh, maybe more efficacious than lecanemab. I know I talked a little bit about, it did look at the clinical dimension rating, some of boxes, and it did go meet that 0.5 change that we think is clinically significant. So it may be more effective. It's dose by infusion once a month. The ARIA is reported slightly higher. We actually had three deaths out of the 850 patients receiving the donanabab that were felt to be treatment related. Um, and I just put the MRIs because I don't think their screening on MRIs was significant, was really that different than it was for lecanemab. Um, but it does seem like these ARIA uh, reported effects are more, are happening more often. Masinumab is um, basically a different type of drug. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, these types of medications have been used for cancer treatment in the past. It inhibits the inflammatory uh, cells. They have one study that shows a 2.15 point favoring the masinumab over placebo. Um, but they plan a confirmatory study uh, it's taken orally, so that's definitely an advantage to uh, be able to take orally compared to the uh, to the our anti-amyloid um, products. 
Adverse effects, you can get a very severe rash. So a Stevens-Johnson's rash is for those that are medical on here. You can get pneumonia, uh, a decrease in neutrophils, which will basically set you up to be more prone to get infection. Um, so the serious adverse effects occur in about 12% of the mesinimab group and 5% in the placebo group. All right, so I'm sorry to go a little bit over time, but I will take any questions that you have now. Thank you, Sue. We do have time for about one question really quickly. The questions that we aren't able to address today, um, we will email out to those attendees the answer. Um, so don't worry, you will still receive an answer to your question. Um, so we did have a couple of attendees who asked a very similar question. They were wondering if the medications that you had listed um, at the very beginning that um, were linked with um, causing the symptoms of um, dementia, if the, um, if the medications were stopped, would the symptoms disappear or um, would they have to... Um, or would the medications cause permanent repercussions? Um, so if those medications are stopped and they, we, I'm going to emphasize, they all need to, just about all of them need to be weaned. It's very important to stop them uh, very slowly so that patients don't withdraw from them. Then we would expect for those symptoms uh, to get better. And that is especially for the anticholinergic medications, since we know that one of the reasons why patients have problems with um, brain function in Alzheimer's disease, especially, and probably with the other dementias as well, is because of the uh, blockage or not enough acetylcholine. Um, so increasing acetylcholine will help that, and then those drugs actually block acetylcholine. So we know that group in particular we do see improvement in those symptoms. Thank you for clarifying that for us. And we wanna thank you for such a, a, a wonderful presentation. It was so detailed. I know that we all learned so much. Um, it was something that we have been looking forward to during the entire project period. So I'm really excited that you were able to present um, during our last webinar of the project. So before we conclude today, um, we are going to go to our project director, Jess Bibbo. They are going to tell us briefly about BRI Care Consultation, which is a care coaching program available for families impacted by dementia in various counties in Ohio through the Administration for Community Living Project. Jess? Great. Thanks, Ashley. And thank you, Sue, for, um, for a really informative uh, presentation. I learned a great deal. Um, so as Ashley said, I'm going to talk about BRI Care Consultation, and it is a telephone and email-based care coaching program. It assists and supports adults who are at risk of developing dementia, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as their uh, family and friend caregivers or supporters. Um, so next slide, please. BRI Care Consultation provides equal support to the person who is living with dementia, as, and as we know, that is an umbrella term, as well as other health conditions, um, as well as helping caregivers themselves. And caregivers work, and, and all clients work with the same care consultant to foster an ongoing relationship that provides continuity of support. And care consultants help to identify unmet needs, provide options to meet those needs, and also help talk through difficult conversations. And as we recognize that in dementia is not one size fits all, um, and neither are care needs. So with BRI Care Consultation, care consultants work to help identify supporters who can step in and help with ongoing tasks. So not everything is on uh, one person's shoulders. Um, and take pressure away from that main person. Next slide, please. So BRI Care Consultation through this grant is available in the following areas in Ohio. In um, Cuyahoga County, we have uh, Benjamin Rose and Welcome House, and they're also serving Lake Geauga, Lorraine, and Medina. And then in uh, our Southern neighbors in Washington County, 
through O'Neill Center and in Athens County through United Seniors of Athens County. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley. Thank you, Jess. So we want to thank you again for joining us today for sorting out the risk and benefits for, of medications for dementia and mild cognitive impairment. So as we mentioned, a copy of the recording and the PowerPoints will be emailed to you. And it will also be made available at www.benrose.org on the event registration page and in our resource library. Please feel free to share the link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who were unable to attend today's session. This webinar, as I mentioned, does conclude the supplemental education sessions for our ACL project, but Benjamin Rose will continue to offer webinars on related topics for older adults, their caregivers, and professionals. Please keep an eye out for information on our upcoming advocacy series webinar that will be discussing the 2024 outlook of policies related to aging. To stay up to date about our upcoming webinars and to find out all that Benjamin Rose has to offer, please visit our website. Again, it's www www.benrose.org. In the chat, you will see a link to a post-session questionnaire. You will also be receiving it in the email sent later today. We ask that you please complete the post-session questionnaire within one week following today's session. Your responses and feedback will be used to show the impact of programs like these and to improve the tools and resources provided to individuals living with dementia and the people that support them. Thank you again to Sue, and thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.